Hello, welcome to another video. This is a video about axial deformation. We have a compound axial member, A, B, C, D. It has nodes at A, B, C, and D. And we're supporting three 10 kip loads as shown. So we have 10 kips applied here, 10 kips applied here, 10 kips applied here, and a fixed connection here at A. That fixed connection means that plane A is not permitted to move or translate. And we will develop a force reaction at A in order to keep this structure in static equilibrium. All parts of this structure have been made of 6061T6 aluminum. The cross-sectional geometry of each segment is shown below. So kind of take a cross-section through piece AB, and we see this hollow cylinder, eight inch outside diameter, half inch thickness. Here at BB, that's telling us the cross section of member BC, and that is a solid cylinder radius of five, uh, 2.5 inches. And lastly, cross section CC tells us the nature of member CD. It's a smaller solid piece of aluminum, three inches of diameter. I do have a CAD model for you. And it looks something like this. Let me kind of zoom out. This one I modeled to scale, so it looks kind of longer and skinnier than my hand sketch, which is not to scale. And here at the end, we see how that 10 kip force could be applied. We don't really have context, but it could be for 2.5 kip forces shown as distributed here. As we kind of go to the next node of the member, we see 10 more kips of force that is concentrically applied to this plane. Here I've got two different plates. I've through bolted them together. So we have through bolted the two plates. There are welds which are not shown or modeled. So there would be a welded connection between this cylinder and that plate. There would be another welded cylinder, or another welded connection between this cylinder and that plate. As we continue down this compound axial member, we will get to yet another connection, another 10 kips of force here. And then finally, our fixed plane to the wall would look something like this. So another weld that connects the cylinder to the plate. The plate is milled with four symmetric holes at the corners. Through the, cor through the holes, you're going to install your anchor bolts. A couple different ways to do this with concrete, but kind of getting beyond the scope of this particular course. Um, but we see these anchors, one, two, three, and then there's a hidden one over here, four. And we are going to idealize this connection connection as fixed. Note that aside from this fixed connection to this amorphous blob of concrete, everything else is just kind of hanging out in space. It's not constrained in any other way. Another way to think about this particular problem, oftentimes we draw these horizontally on the page because they fit nicely, but I think sometimes this problem just makes a little more sense if you visualize it vertically. And the reason why that probably makes more sense is that we're used to inferring the direction of gravity load, gravity force, based on an orientation like this, right? So we could imagine, you know, three telephone pole like structures connected together in this way. And we have 10 kips of force sitting at that platform, 10 more at this platform. 10 more at here. And um, yeah, I think that's a little, little easier way to visualize it when you're dealing with these concepts for the first time. All right, with that overview in mind, we're ready to begin our problem. We're asked to do a few different things. So first, we're asked to solve all of the reactions. Um, we're asked to complete the free body. So this picture up at the top, we know that this is a loading diagram. We know that this is going to be our free body, but it's not yet in equilibrium because we clearly have 30 kips of force going to the left and we need to put that in equilibrium by adding the reaction at A like that. Okay. And of course, this one, this problem is so 
the numbers are you know very easy to add in your head so you don't need to to, to put pen to paper for such a simple computation um, but if this was more complicated or had some, you know numbers that were harder to add in your head you would just do summation of forces in the x direction equals zero assume a sub x is and then pick a direction i would pick left to right and then do your equation of equation of x equilibrium ax minus 10 minus 10 minus 10 equals zero and you'll get 30 kips from that computation. And the fact that we got a positive number there just confirms the assumption. So this is kind of the backup work for this conclusion of a 30 kip reaction there at A. All right, so we've got reactions done. We've got our free body diagram is in equilibrium now, and we are ready to construct the internal axial or normal force diagram. These two terms in this instance can be used interchangeably. And we want to plot this as um, in for normal force. We'll plot positive or tensile normal forces above the line. We'll plot negative or compressive normal forces below the line. And the best way to do this is really with a series of free body diagrams. I used to teach it a different way. So if you find one of my older videos, you may see something a little bit different. But this is the way that I teach it these days. OK, let me get some purple going on here. So what I would like to do is you know, take a cut through member AB. And I want to place that in equilibrium. So I definitely need this 30 kip reaction force. Now I've got my internal force. And two ways to do this, OK? I'll do it. The first way feels kind of unnatural to me, but it is also the most mathematically pure way to do it. So draw it in the positive direction. Summation, I get a different pen. Summation of forces in the x direction is equal to 0, assuming that x is left to right and y is vertical on the page or on the screen. And so you would say in, positive sign left to right, 30 kips, positive sign left to right, set that equal to zero to conclude that n is equal to a negative 30 kips. And another way to say that is 30 kips of compression. Okay. The way that I would be more inclined to do this if I was solving it for myself and not demonstrating a technique to students that are learning this for the first time would to be would be as follows. So by inspection, by inspection, my free body is not in equilibrium. I need to balance out that 30 kip reaction. Therefore, my normal internal force within the fibers of member AB at this particular cut plane, which we could call AA, is equal to 30 kips of compression. So I would show it in a free body this way, and then I would write it if someone wanted to know the answer like this or minus 30 kips. Either one of those would be OK. Now that we've got that done, I'm going to zoom out a little bit, pop back over to this pink layer. And I just want to plot that. So 30 kips of compression, that needs to go on the negative side. So I'm going to plot it right here. 30 kips, little arrow to that marker. I know some of you like to put it over here in the margin, and that's OK as well, kind of as a legend. Um, I also know that some of you like to put negative signs for things that are negative. I tend not to do that because you know, by virtue of the fact that we're drawing it below the line, we know that it's negative. But if that is your preference, um, I can roll with that for sure. OK, let's do another free body. Let's pop another layer on here. I'll do this one in this blue color. And this time, I want to cut the member between B and C to determine what the internal normal force is there. And I have a choice. I could pick the left or the right. I'm going to go with the left. So I kind of draw in my body. Do, 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 do. 
da -da. I'll put forces in this purple color. So we're definitely going to keep this 30 kip. We're going to keep all the reactions. We need this 10 kip. That's a force acting on this free body. So we keep that. And now we need equilibrium. So what do we need to put there to keep this in equilibrium? You can do it the longer mathematically pure way or by inspection, you can say, all right, I've got 30 kips in the positive x direction. I've got 10 kips in the negative x direction. Therefore, I have a net force of 20 kips tending to move or translate this free body to the right. How do I keep it in equilibrium? How do I keep it statically? Um, uh, in static equilibrium, well, all I need to do is do equal and opposite of those 20 kips right here at the cut. So there's my 20 kip force. Since the arrow head is pointing toward the body, that's another compressive force. Okay, let's go ahead and plot that down below. So for this plane, which is BB, I'll go back to my pink layer. I can I know that for all cross-section planes, cross-sectional planes between B and C, my internal force is 20 kips of compression. Okay. Now I also know that at this plane here, the internal normal force it's not defined because we have this jump. So even though mathematically, mathematicians would be inclined to show this as a hollow circle and a hollow circle, it is typical for engineers to close these diagrams. So you'll usually see this with a vertical line between these different segments. I will mention something else. For that same computation, we could have cut a different free body diagram. In fact, there are several that we could have cut. And if you know the rules of free body diagrams, you'll know that they all work. So the idea is that we want to cut at BB, but I could certainly take this piece over here. I've got 10 kips. I've got 10 kips. I've got a net force of 20 kips trying to translate or move this body to the left. It is being held in static equilibrium. So that's how I know. I've got my equal and opposite 20 kips compressive force there. And that is exactly what I see on my plot. Okay. Let's go to another free body. Now we want to find out what's happening between C and D. So we're making this cut. Do that little ch -ch -ch curvy line that shows that we are cutting through the material. Draw this piece of the body. I've got a 10 kip concentric axial force. By inspection, I need an equal and opposite 10 kip force there and that gives me internal compression of 10 kips in that segment and like I said even though mathematically these vertical lines are areas that are um, not defined it is very very typical in engineering practice well that didn't work well it is very very typical in engineering practice to um to show those as closed lines I think I know what I did I got my layers mixed up Boop, paste there. Now I should be able to, no, I still can't color it. Okay, I give up. It's going to have to remain uncolored, uncolored for now. All right, so now moving right along. We have completed most of our tasks for this problem, but the last task we are asked to do is the most computationally intensive. So we did the free body, we got that in equilibrium, we did our internal axial normal force diagram, that's what this thing is. And um, we did that, so we included units. You can show units either on every value the way that I have shown here, or you could just put them in the legend. So you could put kips in the legend here. Either one would be okay. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Now the hard part. Okay, so we would like to compute all member deformations 
and all nodal translations. What the heck does that mean? We would like to compute member deformations and nodal translations. All right, let's get this all situated on my screen. All right, so I've got this mask and we want to remember our axial deformation equation. We're going to use that lowercase delta that is defined as NL over AE. N is the internal force, so we're going to read that directly off of our plot. That's why we made it. L are our undeformed links, so we're going to read that from the links of the members in the di diagram. My cross-sectional areas, we're going to have to use these hollow and solid circles to figure those out. And the modulus of elasticity we need to look up. And if you look in a table for 6061 T6 aluminum, you will see that the modulus of elasticity, capital E, is 10,000 KSI. I'll write that as 10 E3 KSI. We'll be using that throughout. And all three members are all made of the same type of aluminum. So that makes things a little bit easier. We don't have to swap that up. All right, so we want to figure out deformations, changes in the length of each member, and then translations, which are where do nodes A, B, C, and D, where do they shift post-deformation? So there's going to be two parts of this. Let's do the individual deformations. So the deformation or shortening of member AB, I want to plug in the internal force. I always want to go to this diagram. I do not want to try to pull these values from a loading diagram or from a free body diagram. They must come from the internal normal force diagram. That is the whole reason why it exists. So minus 30 kips is going to be my force. My length is 12 feet. I'm going to just preemptively change the units to 144 inches, just multiplying by 12. In the denominator, I need to do the area of this hollow circle. So I'm going to do pi and outer radius squared minus inner radius squared. My outer radius is equal to half of 8. My inner radius is equal to half of 8 minus the wall thickness of 1 half. 4 minus a half is 3.5. Those units are in inches squared. And I've got one other term in my equation that I'm going to need to fit in. That is my 10,000 kips per inches squared. We can simplify this expression a little bit. So at this point, right, you always want to be spot checking your units and making sure your units are okay. So we have these kips and numerator and denominator, they can go away. I've got inches squared here and here. That can go away. That leaves me with inches as my units. Those are the proper units length for deformation. And so I've kind of evaluated that and determined um, that those units are okay. Um, this answer, so the deformation, I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to put kind of my results here, thinking about the space I'm going to need in a minute. Okay, so what you need to put here is a negative sign for a shortening of member AB. The magnitude is 36.67 E minus 3 inches of length. Okay, so it's shortening ever so slightly, just a fraction, a fraction of an inch shortening. Okay, let's go to the next deformation. So what is the deformation or change in length of member BC? That one has internal compression of 20 kips. 
It has a length of 144 inches. In the denominator, I need my area. So I'm going to use pi radius squared. Radius is given as 2.5. Last term is that modulus of elasticity for aluminum. Again, we're 10,000 or 10 E3 kips per inches squared. And I can quickly just spot check my units and make sure I'm okay to cancel things out. And I am. So I'll tabulate that result over to the right as well. The deformation in member BC equals a negative sign because it too is shortening because it has an internal compressive force, 14.67 E minus three inches. Last but not least, and maybe picking up the pace a bit, the deformation in member CD, the last segment, the last solid cylinder of aluminum. Now we've got 10 kips of force, compressive, so negative. Length is still 144 inches. In the denominator, my area, pi radius squared. We're given a diameter, so we need to remember to half that in order to do our radius. And 10 thousand KSI for my modulus. Spot check units, they all look good. And my answer for that to four sig figs of accuracy is minus 20.37 E minus three inches. All right, so I've masked out the calculations. And now that we know all of our member deformations, we're ready to tackle, to tackle our nodal transformations. Okay, and this is where you need to have a little bit of logic in order to do this part of the problem accurately. Here's what I want you to think about. All right, so we know that member AB. We know that member AB shortens by this very, very small amount. We also know that plane A cannot move due to the plane of fixity. I am going to sketch and I'm not going to use Poisson's ratio here just to keep it simple. I'm going to sketch what is happening to member AB in the deformed geometry. Greatly exaggerated, greatly exaggerated. So because we know the constraint that plane A can't move, this deformation He from here, mm, let me draw this a little differently actually. So this distance from here to here, that is equal to the deformation change in length of member AB. But the translation of plane B is from here to here. We use a U for translation, a B for plane B. In other words, the magnitude of this deformation is equal to the translation of the plane, but I'm determining that that plane moves from right to left or in the negative x direction by inspection. Let's go to the next one. So my deformed shape of member BC. Okay, so it gets it gets shorter. That's what this says right here. However, does it change as dramatically as A, B? And the answer is no, for a couple reasons. It's got less force in it. It's got 20 kips of compression, not 30. And we've got a better cross-section. We have more cross-sectional area. So that deformation is being reduced. Get my rectangle tool. And I'm going to, for a moment, pretend like it can't move at B. 
And let me get that a little bit better. What I'm trying to do is eyeball that delta AB about 37, and then delta BC is about 14. So I'm trying to eyeball that so that it's within the right uh, proportional realm graphically of where I want it to be. Okay, so, I've, I, so I do have some deformation. It's a little smaller, but it's not drawn in the right location, correct? Because, let me zoom in here actually. Because that plane must stay connected to B the translation of plane C, I'll make this one C prime, I'll make this one B prime, is equal to the combination of delta AB plus delta BC. We'll do this one more time and you'll see how these deformations accumulate along the length of the member. As we go into delta CD, we've got minus 20.37. Okay, so we've got more deformation in CD than we did in BC, but not as much as AB. Why? Again, there's two things in, in play here. We're looking at the amount of force, so it does have less force, but it also has quite a bit less cross-sectional area. All right, let's try to draw that to scale up here. So about 20. Okay, let's see how I do with this. Rectangle tool. Want to do something kind of like that. Now, I can't draw it in space that way because it must stay connected to its neighbor. So that thing moves there, gets shorter, and it moves over. So by the time we get to the right end, plane D, how much does plane D move? It moves the most of all. It moves from here to here, U for translation, D for D, that is D prime. Do you see how U sub D, translation of no D, is greater than U sub C and it's greater than U sub B. Since this entire structure is in compression and since this is the only plane that cannot move, all of the planes are moving to the left in this instance. Computationally, the way you finish this problem off is starting where you know the translation, almost always that is a zero. So I know that uh, the translation of plane A equals zero, that is by definition. It's by definition of the plane of fixity, that's what that symbol means. U sub B is equal to, I'm going to put a negative sign, and that is in reference to the global x direction. How do I know it's negative? I'm reading it from the picture. Then I want to use the value of delta AB. The negative sign and then the value gives me a translation of 36. I'm going to do this in three sig figs for final answers. 36.7 E minus 3 inches. Moving on to U sub C. How much is plane C moving over? Well, I need to take the cumulative effect of delta AB and delta BC into account. Negative sign by inspection, sum up delta AB plus delta BC. Oops, and mathematically, I better be real careful about this. Just take the value of both of those. 
And mathematically, I'll put this in brackets too. Okay, so negative sign by inspection, I want to take the sum of the magnitudes of the displacement, write that out, um, add those numbers together, and you will get 51.3 E minus 3 inches. Next, what is the translation of D? Well, now I've got to take in account the cumulative effect of this one plus this one plus this one. It's just like before, by inspection, it moves to the left. That's the global negative x direction. And then I want to sum up delta AB, the change in length of member AB plus the change in length of member BC plus the change in length of member CD. That one you will get 71.7 E minus 3 inches. In your final answers, you can either express these with minus signs you can either express these with minus signs like this one, this one, this one, or you can express them with arrows. That is usually my preference. So I would rather see an arrow, an arrow, and an arrow. And if you do that, then you wouldn't show a minus sign at all. So your final answers would be the translation of A is zero. The translation of B is 36.7 E minus three inches to the left. C is da -da 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 to the left. And D is da -da 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 to the left. Cool. That's the end of the video. Hope you enjoyed. See you next time.